those of you who have recently arrived, over the last weeks, we've been discussing the fourth foundation of mindfulness, as it's described in the Satipatthana Sutta. This fourth foundation is called Mindfulness of Dhammas. And in particular, the section on the five aggregates of clinging. So just as a quick review of what these five aggregates are, when we observe our experience carefully, for example, in hearing a sound, the actual sound, the hearing, is the the aggregate of the physical elements. It's the uh, sound waves hitting the eardrum. So that's the aggregate of physical elements, rupa. Along with that sound, there comes an associated feeling tone. It's either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. So that's the aggregate of feeling or vedana. Then there's the perception of what the sound is. That is, we recognize its particular distinguishing marks. So we recognize it as a bird, or a car, or the wind. This is the aggregate of perception. That is, recognition has to do with concepts, it has to do with storing the concepts in memory. And then there are all the habituated tendencies of mind that condition how we're relating to the sound. So this is the aggregate of mental formations, all of those different mental factors which we habitually have in relationship to what's arising. And within this factor of volitional formations or sankara in Pali, volition or intention is considered the chief. And the fifth aggregate is consciousness. That is that which simply knows the object. So all of these five aggregates are always arising together in the moment, but at different times, one or another of them may be predominant. The Buddha spoke often of these five aggregates in many, many of the suttas. He uses this as the basic framework for understanding the subjective experience of what we call self, what we call I. The Buddha also pointed out that when we don't understand these aggregates, when we don't have a clear recognition of them, they become the source of distress in our lives, they become the source of agitation, they become the source of suffering. So this is a very key part of the teachings. What's important to remember when we hear this is that these teachings on the aggregates is not an abstract philosophical inquiry. Rather, it's the Buddha's way of pointing out to us directly how we can experience clearly and distinctly the different aspects of our experience. I was just reminded of the time I was in college, I was studying philosophy, and a study of a lot of interesting ideas. But almost no one was concerned with how any of those ideas applied to my life. You know, and so it was all in a very abstract realm. The power of the Buddha's teachings is the clarity of his understanding, but precisely about how they apply to our lives, how they can actually free ourselves from suffering. So in the great collection of suttas or discourses called the Samyutta Nikaya, it's translated as the connected discourses of the Buddha, there's one entire section which is called the Book of the Aggregates. And in this section, there are 159 short discourses, which goes into 
quite a bit of detail about how we habitually take these aggregates as objects of clinging. And also how we can free ourselves from clinging to them by first recognizing them clearly and then by seeing their impermanent, unsatisfying, and selfless nature. So in the classical progression of these three characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactory, and selflessness, the Buddha usually begins with impermanence because it's so easily recognizable. And he does this with regard to the aggregates in the instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta. So I just want to read this little section from uh, this discourse. So he says, again, monks, in regard to dhammas, one abides contemplating dhammas in terms of the five aggregates of clinging. And how does one, in regard to dhammas, abide contemplating dhammas in terms of the five aggregates of clinging? Here one knows, such is material form, such its arising, such its passing away. Such is feeling, perceptions, volitional formations, consciousness, such as it's arising, such as it's passing away. So the Buddha is giving us a very direct instruction here. Recognize each one of these as they become predominant. Note their arising, note their passing away. This is the contemplation. This is the practice of mindfulness with regard to it. So wherever we are noticing the changing nature, wherever we're noticing the arising and passing away, whether it's of a physical sensation, whether it's of that feeling tone of pleasant, unpleasant neutrality, whether it's a perception, a concept in the mind, whether it's different emotions or moods, different of the mental formations, whether it's consciousness, whenever we are seeing directly for ourselves how something arises and then passes, we are actually putting into practice the Buddha's instruction in this sutta. Although the truth of impermanence (coughs) will reveal itself naturally as we pay attention to each arising object, because things are in their nature changing, so we don't have to create it, and we don't have to do anything special We simply have to be paying attention and we will see the truth of impermanence. Still, we can also set an intention to specifically key in to the fact of things arising and passing away. Given that this is a key instruction of the Buddhas, we can have this intention in mind. So, for example, when we were studying and practicing with Saida Upandita, as many of you know, he was a very demanding teacher and wanted tremendous specificity in our reports about what we were experiencing. He didn't like a lot of metaphors, and he just wanted to know exactly what it was that we were experiencing. But he also asked us to report not only on what it was that arose, you know, a particular sensation or a sound or a thought, but also to report on what happened to that experience as we were aware. So, for example, we might report, I was sitting and experienced a sensation of pressure, I noted it as pressure, and as I watched it, it grew stronger. Or as I watched it, it grew weaker. Or it disappeared, or it shifted position. Well, that was quite demanding because in order to be able to report that, it really required that we be right there and see what happened to it. By practicing in that way, at least for periods of time, it highlighted the truth of impermanence. It was so clear that everything that was arising was changing in one way or another. So we can 
key ourselves into this understanding. Now we know things are changing on every level of experience. And whether we're looking at the most macroscopic or the most microscopic, you know, when you think of the birth and death of stars or, I don't know, the energy vibrations of whatever's happening on the level of quantum reality. You know, you just go from the very biggest to the very smallest and everything in between. We see that it's all in a process of change. Things are arising and passing away. Our bodies you know, take birth, they age, they grow old, they die. Our thoughts, our emotions, moments of consciousness arising and passing away. Our relationships are in a continual process of change. The rise and fall of cultures, of civilizations, of societies, on every level, every aspect, change is so predominant. So just as a simple experiment in this, in the recognition of this, if you can remember between now and the end of the talk, when you get up, you know, at the end of the talk, and you leave the hall, you go outside, out of the room to walk, just pay attention as you're standing up and leaving the hall, pay attention to the flow of changing sensations in the body, of changing sights, the colors and forms that you're seeing as you walk by, the different sounds that are coming and going, whatever passing thoughts are arising and leaving. Just really pay attention to the truth of your changing experience. Because it's not only hour by hour, day by day, Things are changing moment to moment. The truth of this is so ordinary that mostly we've stopped paying attention to it. So this is not some esoteric truth that we have to be in some powerful state of samadhi to experience. It's just what's happening every moment. But it has become so ordinary that we're not looking carefully, we're not experiencing it. And yet, this great truth of impermanence has profound implications for our lives and how we live when we see it clearly, and it has profound implications when we're not seeing it. just in case you still have some doubts about this. A monk, this is from the suttas, uh, in the town of Savati, where the Buddha spent many rainy seasons, he said, a certain bhikkhu sitting to one side said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, is there any form that is permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change, and that will remain the same just like eternity itself? Is there any feeling, perception, volitional formation, any consciousness that is permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change, and that will remain the same just like eternity itself? Okay, so this is Bhikkhu asking the Buddha very direct. And the Buddha replies, Bhikkhu, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no volitional activity, no consciousness that is permanent, that is stable eternal, not subject to change, and that will remain the same, just like eternity itself. So again, the Buddha is very, this is a very clear statement, and it's not that we need to believe it, we need to really see it for ourselves over and over again. Contemplating the impermanence of these five aggregates reminds us that they are all part 
of an endlessly passing show. There's no real lasting substance in any of it. And precisely for this reason, they are in the end ultimately unsatisfying. They're unsatisfying because they don't last. My first teacher, Munindraji, used to, part of his kind of teaching questions, he would, he would ask us, where is the end of seeing? Where is the end of hearing, of smelling, of tasting, of touching, of thinking? There's no end to it because, you know, we have a moment of seeing or hearing or smelling and then it's gone and then we want another and another and another and another. And it does not come to an end. It's not to say that there's anything wrong in these experiences. It's just that through a direct seeing, a vivid, clear seeing of their momentariness, we come to realize deeply that they cannot fulfill us, that that is not where fulfillment is to be found. So it becomes so obvious you know, as we look again and again and again. It's so strange, though, because we live our lives so often just waiting for the next hit of experience, you know, as if the next thing will finally fulfill us or make us happy. And we do this... You can see it at play in terms of our worldly desires. You know, those of you who've been here for some time have, have you probably had some thoughts about kind of just the first fun thing you'll do when you leave. You know, and it could be whatever your particular fantasy is. But that also is just going <laughs> to arise and soon be passed. Just a little secret. It's not going to be as fulfilling as you imagine. (laughs) We do the same thing not only with our worldly desires, though we also do it in our meditation practice itself. How often are we waiting for the next concentrated walking or the next easeful sitting? You know, as if that's kind of the culmination That's what we're grasping for. Came across a very interesting uh, sutta in this regard. Of a monk who, in a very fundamental way, was attached to concentration and then suffered Uh, in the lack of it. So I'll just read this, uh, a short sutta. He said, On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. We have our own squirrel sanctuary here. (laughs) Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Asaji was dwelling in a potter's shed, sick, afflicted, gravely ill. Then the Blessed One, dressed and taking bowl and robe, approached the Venerable Asaji and said, I hope you are bearing up. I hope you are getting better. I hope that your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that their subsiding, not their increase, is to be discerned. The Buddha was just coming in a very compassionate way. The Venerable Asaji said, Venerable Sir, I am not bearing up. I am not getting better. Strong, painful feelings are increasing in me, not subsiding. And their increase, not their subsiding, is to be discerned. And the Buddha said, I hope, Asaji, that you are not troubled by remorse and regret. And the monk replied, Indeed, Venerable Sir, I have quite a lot of remorse and regret. The Buddha said, I hope, Asaji, that you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard to virtue. Asaji replied, I have nothing, venerable sir, for which to reproach myself in regard to virtue. And the Buddha, if you have nothing for which to reproach yourself in regard to virtue, Asaji, why are you troubled by remorse and regret? 
Okay, so here we're getting to the... Formerly, Venerable Sir, when I was ill, I kept on tranquilizing the bodily formations, but now I do not obtain concentration. As I do not obtain concentration, it occurs to me, let me not fall away from the path. So he was worried. He was worried because he couldn't attain concentration, he was falling off the path. And the Buddha replied, it is only those ascetics and Brahmins, Asaji, who regard concentration as the essence and identify concentration with the path, failing to obtain concentration might think, let us not fall away. I was just very struck by that. You know, because how often are we just looking in our practice for different states? And then when the states don't come, we feel we're not practicing well or we're falling away from the path and there's remorse and regret and all of that. And the Buddha is saying so clearly that is not the essence of the path. The essence is awareness. The essence is not clinging. So we need to really internalize this understanding. There's a certain paradox of the spiritual life that as objects of clinging, the whole range of passing phenomena, whether of the body or of the mind, as objects of clinging, all experience leaves us unfulfilled, precisely because they're so impermanent. But as objects of mindfulness, those very same arising objects become the vehicles of our awakening. So it's not the problem of experience. It's not the problem of what's arising. Rather, are they objects of clinging or objects of mindfulness? That is the key. Remember that we do not have to wait for some good experience in order to be mindful. There is nothing outside the range of mindfulness. Whatever it is that is arising, we can be aware. We cannot cling. So just remember the monk Asaji. Sick, ill, dying, pains increasing, concentration has has fallen away. Not a problem. When we understand the essence of the path. Now, from contemplating the impermanent, (coughs) unsatisfying nature of the aggregates, we also open to the deepest experience of them being non-self. And when this is understood, and more fully understood, we no longer claim ownership of these aggregates as I or mine and so no longer suffer when they inevitably change. This is a radically different way of viewing this mind and body, of not claiming ownership of them. The Buddha used a very good example for this. There's an example of people carrying off grasses and sticks and shrubs from uh, a forest grove. Okay, and this, this again was at, in the town of Savati, where he was staying. And the Buddha said, when you hear this, it's as if the Buddha is talking to us. You know, this is, this is the, the teaching for us here. Bhikkhus... That's us. Whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Suppose, bhikkhus, people were to carry off the grass, sticks, branches, and foliage in this jetta's grove, or to burn them, or to do with them as they wish. Would you think 
people are carrying me off, burning me or doing with me as they wish. No, venerable sir, because that is neither ourself nor what belongs to ourself. Okay, you get the picture? People are carrying off stuff. Not upset, not a problem, because what they're carrying off does not belong to me. So too bhikkhus, form is not yours. Feeling is not yours. Perception is not yours. Volitional formations are not yours. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. What you have abandoned, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. Now, abandoning here means abandoning the sense of ownership, abandoning that identification with the aggregates as being I or mine. So it seems so clear and so obvious, you know, just imagine the freedom if we were not taking this body and mind to be self. It would be a state of great fearlessness. You know, as it went through its changes, its inevitable changes, it would not be a problem. So the question arises, how have we become so attached to these aggregates? You know, how have we become so identified with them as being self, as being who we are? It's as if our claim of ownership has been long established in the cosmic registrar of deeds. You know, and we defend our claims with the greatest tenacity. You know, we are holding on to this claim of ownership. So over the past weeks, we've discussed ways we come to identify with the different of the aggregates and how also to free ourselves. But tonight I just want to explore this a little bit further. We become attached and identified with the idea of self because we rely on and are satisfied with our superficial perceptions and the concepts which we use to describe experience. So this complacency of observation, you know, we do observe things and we have a momentary recognition, a perception, but then we stay satisfied with that superficial perception and often don't look deeper, don't look beneath it. So this complacency of observation keeps us from seeing more deeply the impermanent, the insubstantial nature of what it is we're calling self. So we can see this very clearly in relationship to the body. We get up in the morning, we look in the mirror, see certain colors and forms, recognize a pattern, create a concept designating what we see, Joseph, self, yep, that's me. And we do this over and over again. As if Joseph, or I, or self, is some substantial being that the words, the concepts are actually referring to. So we rely on this superficial perception. We create a concept based on the appearance and then believe that the concept actually is pointing to something substantial. And this is how the world operates. We live a lot in the world of concepts and the idea of solidity of things. Not only about reflections in a mirror, but about our bodies, about physical phenomena in the world. How much of our sense of self comes from the superficial perception we have of the body? You know, it seems so solid, so me. I saw an ad in the New York Times uh, 
a little while ago. It was an ad for a certain T-shirt, and the, the kind of writing on the T-shirt said, "Me, me, me," <laughs> and that's sort of how we feel. <laughs> I mean, isn't it? You know, me. <laughs> this is me. So I thought we should have an IMS T-shirt saying, "Not me, not me, not me." <laughs> But when we take time to observe more carefully, contemplating this aggregate of rupa, the physical elements, the first aggregate, we cut through the illusion of solidity. We see the composite nature of what it is that we're calling the body. You know, at one level we see it in terms of just many interrelated systems, the skeletal system, and the muscular system, and the circulatory system, and all the different organs you know, and one very well-established teaching of the Buddha meditation is the practice called contemplating the 32 parts of the body. You know, and he divides it up, uses it in terms of how it's understood then, but it's a lot of the same elements. You know, it starts with hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, goes on to organs and blood. And it's just contemplating, it's breaking down, okay, what is it that we actually call the body? We see that body is just a concept, you know, designating the relationship of a lot of different elements. But what's so amazing, you know, even if we know this intellectually, we wrap up all these different elements in skin and then we get very attached to it and we get very attached to other people's bodies. I just wonder how much attachment there would be if we had x-ray vision, you know, and really saw what this is. And then to also see how much attachment to the body, because we're not seeing it for what it is, conditions our fear of death. Because we are claiming ownership taking this body to be me, to be I, to be self. So naturally there'll be fear of death as the body decomposes. We could look even deeper, you know, on the cellular level or on the atomic level. You know, we see that the body is really mostly empty space. In meditation, and this is one of the great gifts and powers of our meditation practice as we train our mind in greater concentration and greater mindfulness, greater attentiveness, we cut through the illusion of solidity. And we begin to experience directly the body as a fluid energy system. So I want to read a little bit this is the book on Deepa Ma. And most of you probably know she was one of our teachers and this very, very extraordinary woman. Um, she had a lot of suffering in her life and then came to the practice and very quickly she had extraordinary paramis, you know, background in a very short time, achieved high states of realization and also many of the psychic powers you know, that, that are talked about in the Buddhist tradition. So this, this is kind of like for fun. Okay. There are said to be higher powers accessed through extraordinary degrees of concentration. And like supernatural powers of the ability to transform one of the four basic elements of the physical world into another. So this is some of the stories told by my teacher, Munindra, who taught Deepa Ma how to do all this. She said, according to Deep Manindra, Deepa Ma demonstrated each of these powers to him. The following accounts are based on Manindra's recollections. You may not believe it, he said, but it's true. Okay, that's just, you may or may not believe it. Once Manindra was in his room when he noticed something unusual in the sky outside his window. He looked out and saw Deepama in the air near the tops of the trees, grinning at him and playing in a room she had built in the sky. 
By changing the air element into the earth element, she had been able to create a structure in mid-air. Changing denser elements to air produced only slightly less astonishing occurrences. Sometimes Deepa Ma and her sister arrived for interviews with Munindra by spontaneously appearing in his room. And Deepa Ma occasionally left by walking through the closed door. If she was feeling especially playful, she might rise from her chair, go to the nearest wall, and walk right through it. Now I know that to our Western understanding of things, this seems quite unbelievable. And it's not so much suggesting that you need to believe this, But I think it does point to possibilities that may be beyond our current level of understanding. As long as we stay fixated on the level of concepts, as long as we stay caught in superficial perceptions of things, our understanding and our possibilities are limited. I just want to put in a little PS here. It's not that either these powers or the belief in them is in any way central or essential to the path of awakening. It's quite a side track. But I like it because, having been students of both Manindra and Deepama, I have a certain faith and confidence in this possibility. And it just points to things that are beyond our current level of knowledge, our current level of understanding. When we see that the world is not as fixed and as solid as appears to us. Okay, so we create this felt sense of felt sense of self when we our identified claim ownership of the body. It also happens, we create a sense of self, when we identify with the different mental aggregates, you know, of feelings, of thoughts, of emotions. Notice the felt sense of self when you're lost in a thought. Really pay attention to what it feels like you know, of how the I is created, the sense of I when we're lost in a thought and identified with that thought. I'm thinking, I'm planning, I'm judging, I'm remembering. You know, it's that sense of the I being created. But what we can see in our practice is that the I is quite extra. We're adding that to the simple arising of a thought, the passing of a thought. Or when we identify with the stories we make up about our experience. You know, we live largely in the world of mental projections. We are just creating stories throughout the day about ourselves, about other people. You know, pay attention to all the stories, even fleeting ones, that you have about your fellow yogis. You know, maybe, maybe you're caught in different Vipassana romances, you know, where you just create a whole projection. Maybe they're Vipassana vendettas. You know, it's somebody who's really bugging you, and you create a whole story. Or, you know, all those quick little subtle evaluations of their practice. You know, good yogi, bad yogi. And this is what the mind is doing. It is so freeing to realize that the only power that thoughts have is the power that we give them. The thought itself is little more than nothing. It's just like this little blip in the mind arising and passing away. But when they're unnoticed and we're identified with them, when we're taking them to be self, we are giving them an enormous power in our lives. 
So notice carefully the difference between, in your experience, not, not intellectually, notice the difference in your experience between times when you're lost in a thought and times when you're aware that you're thinking. There is a huge difference in the experience of mind during those times. This is from a teaching great Tibetan master, Dilgo Kense Rinpoche. And he just, he says it so well. He says, when a rainbow appears, we see many beautiful colors. Yet a rainbow is not something we can clothe ourselves with or wear as an ornament. It simply appears through the conjunction of various conditions. Thoughts arise in the mind in just the same way. They have no tangible reality or intrinsic existence at all. There is therefore no logical reason why thoughts should have so much power over us, nor any reason why we should be enslaved by them. Once we recognize that thoughts are empty, the mind will no longer have the power to deceive us. But as long as we take our deluded thoughts as real, they will continue to torment us mercilessly as they have been doing through countless past lives. So this is a great practice for us. Just over and over again to see thoughts, to be aware, to be mindful of thoughts as they arise, seeing their essentially empty, selfless nature. They don't belong to anyone. They just arise out of conditions like a rainbow and pass away. But it takes a lot of practice. We've been seduced for so long. So we need to see again and again and again their empty nature. But as we do, it affords us a tremendous degree of freedom. And it's the same thing with emotions. You know, we become identified with a certain mood or mind state. And it's not only creating the felt sense of I when we're lost in that arising mood or emotion, but often we build a whole life story around that feeling. I'm this way. It's such a deep pattern. It's going to take so long to get free of this. And we just kind of build this, this story of ourselves. And all that is actually happening is the rise and fall of the aggregates in the moment. That's all it is. It's just it's another mental formation coming, arising, passing. So can we see it for what it is? This is the contemplation of the aggregates that is so freeing. Now, building a life story... And for those of you who have been in retreats of mine know that I could never let an opportunity pass without mentioning the Big Dipper <laughs> but building a life story is having the perception that the Big Dipper is always there but what is the Big Dipper? The Big Dipper is just the superficial perception of a pattern of stars. We see stars in a certain pattern, and we give it a certain name. And then if we examined each star in particular, we'd say that each star is not a thing in itself. You know, it's just like a big nuclear factory, nuclear power plant, and changing hydrogen into helium and neutrinos and whatever else it's doing. When we're looking at the star that carefully, when we're really seeing what it is, the concept of star has gone away. The concept of Big Dipper is completely gone. And it's so strange. We can know this about something millions of light years away, and yet we don't know it about this very mind and body. We're taking this mind and body 
to be like the Big Dipper, as if this is a self, this, some existing, ongoing being, entity. And the whole practice is just to look through that, to get through that illusion. It's, our th- it's through our practice of mindfulness, you know, as outlined in the Satipatthana Sutta, that shows us the very practice we're doing is showing us moment after moment, again and again, the impermanent, unsatisfying, selfless nature of each of these aggregates as they come. This is what the Buddha called true knowledge. There's a monk speaking to the Buddha. It is said, true knowledge, true knowledge. What now, sir, is true knowledge? The Buddha's replying, here, bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple understands form is subject to arising, subject to vanishing, subject to arising and vanishing, understands feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness, subject to arising, subject to vanishing subject to arising and vanishing. This bhikkhus is called true knowledge. This is what we're doing in our practice, just seeing each of these aggregates arising and vanishing. We're practicing seeing that because seeing it frees us from this habit of claiming ownership, claiming them to be I or mine. So with this foundation of understanding, this understanding of the aggregates, the Buddha gives a series of discourses in which he deconstructs the concept of self with a tremendously incisive clarity. And we see that the self or I is not something we have to get rid of. It's not something we need to demolish because it's not there in the first place. So I'd like to read from this sutta. And this is a series of questions and answers between the Buddha and some monks. And first I just want to read parts of it you know, as it's in the text and then read it again, adapting it, adapting some of the language just to our own experience. Now, the background of the sutta, it's set in the context of the ancient uh, Buddhist philosophical traditions. But the manner of the Buddhist teachings and the way he leads us through, it can effect a radical change of understanding. So there's something very profound in these teachings, but it takes kind of following the thread of the argument. Okay, so this is the background to the instruction. There were a group of wanderers who came to speak with a monk whose name was Anuradha. And these wanderers said to Anuradha, They were talking of the Buddha. He said, he exists after death, or does not exist after death, both does and does not exist. Neither exists nor doesn't exist. So this is kind of a classical ancient Indian philosophical. You know, it is and it isn't, and both is and isn't, neither is or isn't. You know, so that's a classic form. But Anuradha said, the Buddha is spoken of in other ways, than these. So then the wanderers just started making fun of Anuradha. This brother must be a novice, or if an elder, he is an ignorant fool. Okay, so Anuradha was a little dismayed by their denigration, and he thought, how could I answer, have answered that's in accord with the truth? So he went to the Buddha, you know, re- recounted the exchange, So then the Buddha asked Anuradha a series of questions. 
Okay, now, again, as you listen to the questions, just imagine the Buddha is asking you the question. Okay, and it, these are not hard questions. Is the body, so this is the Buddha asking Anuradha, is the Buddha body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, oh Lord. Okay, simple. Are feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, consciousness, permanent or impermanent? Impermanent. What is impermanent is that reliable or unreliable? Satisfying or unsatisfying? Okay, so just think, what is impermanent? Is that satisfying or unsatisfying, ultimately? Is it reliable or unreliable? So Anuradha replies, unreliable, unsatisfying. So then the Buddha asks, what is impermanent, unreliable, what is of the nature to change? Again, which is all of the aggregates just mentioned. What is impermanent, unreliable, what is of the nature to change, is it proper to regard that as this is mine, this is myself, this is I? No, Bhante, no, venerable sir. Okay, so now you need to follow this. So the Buddha asks Anuradha, and when the Buddha talks of himself, he refers to himself as the Tathagata. So that's the term he uses to refer to himself. So now, Anuradha, do you regard the Tathagata's body as being the Tathagata? Surely not. Do you regard feelings, perceptions, formations, consciousness as being the Tathagata? Surely not. Do you regard the Tathagata as being something apart from these five aggregates? No, Bhante, no, venerable sir. So none of these aggregates are considered to be the Tathagata, and the Tathagata is not something apart from them either. Do you regard the Tathagata as having no body, no feelings, no perception, no volitions, no consciousness, surely not. Okay, this is, the, this is the key line. Then since in just this life, the Tathagata is not to be found, is not met with in reality, is it proper to say of him he can be spoken of in some other way after death? No, Bhante. Well said, Anuradha. Both formally and now, only this do I teach. What suffering is and what is its end. Okay, so this is the first run-through. I just want to run through it again with reference to ourselves rather than to the Tathagata. Okay, is body permanent or impermanent? Right, feelings, perceptions, volitions, consciousness, permanent or impermanent? Okay, impermanent. Is what's impermanent reliable or unreliable? Unreliable. Is what's unreliable, impermanent, subject to change? Is it proper to call that, this is mine? This is I, this is myself. It's like the twigs in the grove. They're just elements, they're impersonal elements. Now it's not proper to take this as being I, mine, or self. So now, do you regard your body, given this, given this understanding, do you regard your body as being self? Surely not. Do you regard feelings, perceptions, formations, consciousness as being self? Surely not. 
do you regard self as being something apart from these aggregates? Is that how we think of self, as being something apart from this? No, Bhante. Do we regard self as having no body, no feeling, no perception, no volitions, no consciousness? No, Bhante. You're kind of staying with this. We're seeing that the body is not self, all the aggregates are not self, the self is not something apart from the aggregates. It's not that the self is something apart from all of these things. So then, since in this very life, the self is not to be found, does it make sense to speak of what happens to it after death? The whole question disappears. Well said, Anuradha. Both formally and now, only this do I teach. What is suffering and what is its end? So this this sutta is worthy of some contemplation because it uses the teachings of the aggregates to simply deconstruct the notion that there is a self there in the first place. Now what's so amazing about this, you know, when we realize that Big Dipper is just a concept, does anything change in the sky? Nothing changes. Everything is exactly as it always was. It's just that we're seeing things more clearly. When we see Big Dipper as just a concept, we get less attached to the Dipper. When we see self is just a concept, everything stays the same, the same as it always was. But when we see that self or I is a concept, it frees us from attachment to these elements. It frees us from identification with these elements. It frees us from this sense of ownership of them. These teachings on the five aggregates really provide a very profound reference point for a deepening understanding in our lives. You know, it makes us question, what is it that we are attached to? What is it that we are craving? Do we understand that the nature of this path of practice is not about some new experience of the aggregates? We're not practicing to have a better feeling or a better perception, or a higher state of consciousness. But rather we're practicing in order to free the mind from any clinging to the aggregates as being I or mine. That's the essence of our practice. That's our path. So I'd just like to close... This is a night for sutta readings. This this just kind of sums it up again. This is uh, the Buddha at Savati. He said, bhikkhus, this samsara, this round of rebirth, is without discoverable beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings roaming and wandering on hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. There comes a time, bhikkhus, when the great ocean dries up and evaporates and no longer exists. But still, I say, there is no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming and wandering on, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. Suppose, bhikkhus, a dog 
tied up on a leash, was bound to a strong post or pillar. It would just keep on running and revolving around that same post or pillar. So too, the uninstructed worldling regards form as self, feeling as self, perception as self, volitional formations as self, consciousness as self. He just keeps running and revolving around form, feelings, perception, formations, consciousness. And as he keeps on running and revolving around them, he is not freed from them. He is not freed from birth, aging, and death. Not freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. Not freed from suffering. But the instructed noble disciple does not regard form as self, nor feeling as self, nor perceptions as self, nor volitional formations as self, nor consciousness as self. He no longer keeps turning and revolving around them. As he no longer keeps running around them, he is freed from them, freed from birth, aging, and death, freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair, freed from suffering. So let's sit for a few moments. The arising and changing nature of each aspect of your experience, whether it's sensations or thoughts or emotions or sounds, Whatever it is that's arising, and you can use the very ordinary understanding of them, simply see their changing nature. 